Our next session is the speech by Mrs. Mary Byrne, Editor-in-Chief at the Olympic Broadcasting Service. With the upcoming Beijing Winter Games just around the corner, what can Winter Sports Federations do to enhance their opportunities and reach out to greater audiences? The voice of the following speaker would be a critical statement to the summit. Representing the voice of an organization, part of the Olympic family committed to the development of sports in a sustainable and innovative way. So it is my great privilege and honor to bring on stage Mrs. Mary Byrne, Editor-in-Chief at the Olympic Broadcasting Service. Welcome, Mrs. Byrne. Hi. Good afternoon. How Good are afternoon. you? Good. How are you? Doing very well. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to join you. Okay, so we would like you to share about the experience of Tokyo 2020, especially uh, the growing the success on OTT platform. Certainly. Um, Tokyo was an amazing experience, a very different experience than what we expected. Um, obviously, a very complicated experience um, with the COVID restrictions and everything that happened. Um, but it, as Megan was saying as well, it also provided opportunity. Um, I think it's important to remember that in any sport event, even in the best of times, the majority of people can't actually be there. And so Tokyo was a great opportunity for us to really think about how can you deliver a better digital experience for all of those fans who cannot be in the stadiums. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to have any spectators in Tokyo, um, which was very sad. Um, I felt so much for our, my Tokyo 2020 colleagues for how hard they had worked to then not have people in the stands um, with beautiful venues and amazing shots. Um, but I think, again, Tokyo forced people to be creative and to think about different ways to include fans, to create connections between athletes and fans and their family. And hopefully those kinds of changes will carry over even with hybrid situations and eventually as fans do come back. So Winter Olympic is also coming. So how do you think, yeah. how do you look forward to Beijing Winter Games? Yes, but with Beijing, there's still lots of questions. Um, we still have a few months, uh, but we're looking at it in a similar way, which is we're not sure um, what it's going to look like yet. So we have to think about what are our options? Um, what will it look like with fans? What will it look like if it's hybrid? And so we want to continue to build on those things that worked in Tokyo, finding ways to connect athletes and fans, finding ways, what is that behind the scenes that you can offer? Um, what is that user-generated content that's created by an athlete, making that more available to more people? Um, and as well as getting fans involved, you know, what, what do they want to know? What are they interested in and how can we directly connect them? How can we make them feel like they're a part of the, of the games, whether that's clapping um, through a chair map, whether that's sending a video that that's then shown on a video board, things like that. So how do you think the difference between Tokyo 2020 and Beijing Winter Games, is there any situation similar that you can um, copy your success experience or what challenges will you face? Um, I think the biggest challenge with winter sports is it's harder to actually see the athletes. Um, and by that, I mean, if it's a hockey player, there's wearing a mask, there's a helmet, skiing, they're going so fast <laughs> down the mountain. You don't see them till the end and they whip off their helmet. Um, and so those are things that you sort of have to think with those athletes in those sports, for example, how can you make sure that you make that extra effort so that we see who they are, so we know who they are? Um, with sports like figure skating, where um, thanks to the sport and the emotional nature of it, you, all, you have a really good sense of who those athletes are, but we know who they are on the ice. We know the story um, of their choreography, and that may be very different than who they are as a person. And so I think it's that opportunity to, to show who the athlete is off the ice, off the mountain, and give that broader, that broader view of them. So do you think how, how much to how much degree the pandemic will have impact on Beijing Winter Games? 
Um, I think it will definitely have an impact. Um, certainly, we've seen different countries with different kinds of re uh, requirements regarding vaccination. Uh, there will be undoubtedly there'll be a lot of COVID restrictions on the ground. Uh, we saw that in Tokyo, it's still being developed for Beijing in terms of making sure, number one, that the athletes are safe. Uh, that, again, these are athletes who have spent their entire lives uh, building for this moment. We want to make sure that there are safe corridors, safe ways to interview, to interact with them or not interact with them, whatever the, the restrictions may be, to make sure that they're all safe. Even so... There are still ways to, whether it's through events leading up to Beijing or whether it's in Beijing itself, to be able to speak to them, um, to be able to share their stories, and more importantly, for them to share their stories. Um, how can we make sure that they feel comfortable and empowered and are sharing their story? And I think that's, that's something that we will see in Beijing. So how do you think about um, the bubble, well, how much will it influence, like the athletes or the workers, anyone, as for the bubble mode? Yeah, um, I think it's hard to say. Uh, the organizing committee is still working that out. What I think is important to remember is we want to make sure that fans are getting the best information. Um, and not that COVID doesn't exist and not to diminish it, but to make sure that the experience isn't so much about the bubble, but rather it's about the sport and the amazing things that are happening there to get to know the athletes. Um, they have a harder road because of everything they've been through over the past couple of years with the pandemic. Um, it will be complicated on site, but because of that, not in spite of it, we want to make sure that we take that extra effort to, to celebrate the athlete, to get you excited as a fan about the sport. Uh, winter sports are amazing. Uh, they're dangerous. <laughs> uh, and not to diminish the danger, but they're exciting. Whether it's, uh, you know, pair skating and seeing these amazing throws and what's happening there, seeing the different moves, seeing how athletes are constantly challenging themselves, explaining that to fans, letting them know just how amazing it is what they're seeing and how difficult it is. Uh, I think sometimes it's hard to understand that with winter sports. Um, I always use the example, in summer, you see an athlete run, you know I'm a horrible runner. <laughs> so when I see them run super fast, I understand, I have a little bit of an understanding that I could never do that or just how fast they're going. I've never had the privilege of being on a skeleton. Uh, I've done figure skating, but let's be honest, <laughs> not happening anytime soon. But so to have that understanding of the skill of the athletes, I think is really important. Okay. Um, can you explain how the operations of the Olympic channel are planned during the games? What are you offering to the spectators? Sure. Um, so I'm the editor in chief for Olympics.com. And so on the site, uh, you'll have information from now until the games to get so you can get to know the athletes, so you can get to know the sport. Um, and then, of course, during games time, we ramp it up um, and you'll see you'll have live blogs. So if you want to sort of understand what's happening all over the place, that's the hardest thing about the games. Right. You have multiple things happening at the same time. And so we'll have a live blog for you to know that someone just scored in the women's hockey game, that curling is happening, that figure skating is going to start in half an hour, don't miss it, to keep you up to date with everything um, so that you see the schedule, you see the results. But most important, again, the stories. Who is this athlete? What have they been through? What matters to them? Uh, and telling those stories and every day making sure that you know those athletes who are potentially going to be the stars that day. And I think it's important as well. We can start to say now, here's an athlete that we think is primed for a medal, say in figure skating. But there's a whole other series of athletes who probably will not medal, but have amazing stories. And so we always want to make sure that we're telling as many stories as possible. It's not just about performance on the ice, but it's also about what someone has been through to get to that position. 
uh, and what they're doing off the ice as well. These are human beings, right? We have to always remember that. This isn't someone who's just a robot who's going to perform um, on the ice. This is someone who has a full life, and we have to make sure that we never forget that, and we find ways to show that even during the game. How will you engage with the community? Do you feel that the fans are more and more connected and requesting more access to the content? How do you deliver and cover these needs? Yes, fans are super engaged. I think in particular on figure skating, it is an amazing fan base, super invested and super knowledgeable. And so as we get to games, that fan base starts to expand and it changes a bit. And in, during games, you have fans who are more casual fans who know, oh, it's Olympics, I wanna watch figure skating. And then you have fans who watched the Nebelhorn Trophy this past weekend to find out who got the ultimate spots for the games. So it's sort of at two different ends of the spectrum. So I think it's important through social media, through olympics.com, through our platform, how can we engage directly with fans? What are the questions that they have for the athletes? Can we include those? How do we make sure that their voices are heard as well? And then as well, creating opportunities, be it through an Instagram Live or different things to where fans and athletes can actually speak to each other. And I think as well, speaking with athletes and having athletes share their world directly um, without having that filter of us in between. During the Tokyo 2020, there are like 20 to 30 games taking place simultaneously. However, um, the audiences can only choose like up to six when they are watching during the local local OTT platform, is there any chance that audiences can sus like subscribe to the OBS platform or something like that, that I can watch hundreds of channels, hundreds of games at the same time? Is it possible after in the future? Unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, probably not. Um, as we know, uh, through the International Olympic Committee, they have a very strong relationship with a variety of rights-holding broadcasters. Uh, whether that's uh, Eurosport, uh, et cetera, uh, and to make sure, and they have some fairly long-term contracts. And so that relationship is very important um, and they provide a really great experience. But yes, it does, it unfortunately creates the situation. You can't see everything at once. So audiences have to watch the games um, from the local platform, right? Due to the- Correct due to the copyright. Exactly, um, just having sold those rights to the broadcasters, but that creates an opportunity for us on olympics.com as well as on the social handles to provide additional content, to give you different aspects, um, to give you a bit of the behind the scenes, to give you something directly from an athlete, uh, for a fan to engage directly, uh, and hopefully provide a good experience, uh, a supplementary complementary. Okay. Could you share with us some of your most memorable or highlight of the digital content you and your team produced for Tokyo 2020? Oh, tough question. Uh, I, think, uh, I think what I'm most proud of is we had a live blog in seven different languages. Um, we'll have it in nine different languages for Beijing. Uh, and I think that gave you, as an Olympic fan, the best way to really absorb and understand everything that was happening in the games all at once to keep, thing, keep up with things. Um, with the summer games, it's just so hectic. Uh, and I think as well, one of the things that we did that I really loved is we reached out to the families of some of the athletes and had them uh, shoot a message for their the athlete. So for example, PB Sindhu, a badminton player from India, um, her parents and her brother had a message wishing her luck and, of course, they couldn't be there um, and sending their love to her. Uh, Mary Kam, a boxer from India, three of her children, super cute, uh, encouraging her. And it just, you know, I'm smiling as I think about it. It was those kinds of messages that really showed that connection uh, and just made you feel good. I also remember that um, before the swimming ceremony, the winners will have a phone call, a video phone call to their parents, to their family, right? 
Exactly. It is very um, that, was something, that was great. OBS stepped that up to have those moments. So athletes could then exactly have that phone call with their family. Um, that again, I think is one of those innovations that happened during the games because people couldn't be there. And I'm hopeful that it can continue even when you do have fans because not everyone can go. The Olympic channels is doing some formats, not only live events. Can you explain a bit the plans for that leading up to Beijing? Will we see some figure skating long format content? Uh, you might. Uh, stay tuned. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll have uh, we'll there. We have always before games um, a variety of documentary type content. Uh, so we'll have different series coming out uh, from now through the end of January, looking at different sports, different athletes, um, showing their behind the scenes and their journey. And one of those will be focused on figure skating. So how do you plan for all the contents? How to manage, like, um, how much degree will put on figure skating? How much, um, like, skate other speed skating or for other sports? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, obviously, with Olympics.com, we need to make sure that we're respectful of all sports, that we're covering all sports. Uh, but we're also very conscious of our audience. And so we're constantly looking through our dashboards, um, through our data insights, looking at our audience and how it's shifting. Um, are they male or female? What are their ages? Where are they coming from? Uh, and making sure that we're representative of, of our audience. Um, if we see that we have a strong audience in figure skating around these ages, then we're going to create content in a slightly different way. Um, what are we doing on TikTok versus what are we doing on Instagram versus what are we doing on Olympics.com versus what is the long form? Um, and so we'll look at that audience data. Uh, and we also want to build community. Um, we have the privilege of having a very strong figure skating audience for olympics.com. Uh, I'm not going to take that for granted. We have to continue. We have to do better. We have to make sure that we're still giving them the kind of content that they want. Uh, there are things that we may think are important, but audience wins. <laughs> Fans win. Um, we always have to listen to what they have to say and what they're interested in. And they vote every day. You know, we see what they're reading, we see what they're watching, and if they're, we may love something, but if no one watched it, you know, then we have to, it doesn't matter that I love it, we have to understand that it didn't connect with the fan for whatever reason. Think about how do we adjust that, how do we shift that uh, to make sure that we're delivering content the fans want. And so during games, of course, we'll cover all sports, um, but we m want to make sure that across all of those sports that we continue to build those communities and make sure that people feel included and that they can come to us and get the information and the stories they want. You just mentioned TikTok, right? What is the Olympic Channel approach to young, upcoming, or not so well-known athletes? Will we see some of their stories as well as in the Olympic Channel, like the Mexican figure skater that will represent Mexico for the first time in the Games? Exactly. We always want to make sure that we're uh, representing those historic firsts. Uh, and certainly within the Olympic movement, there's always there is a strong commitment to youth. Uh, for example, uh, before the pandemic, we had the Youth Olympic Winter Games uh, in Lausanne. Uh, the next will be in Gangwon, uh, which we're very excited about in, in 2024. Uh, and so those Youth Olympic Games are a great opportunity to kind of see who's coming up and who we're going to see in Beijing. We certainly saw that in figure skating, where we saw some of those medalists in Lausanne. We expect them in Beijing and to do big things. Uh, youth is really important. Um, if we can't make Olympic fans out of today's young people, then what happens to the Olympics, right? You have to make sure that we're future-proofing. And so that means different types of content. Um, it doesn't, not everything has to be short, but making sure that it's reflective. Um, someone who's 18 probably isn't super interested uh, in a story about a 52-year-old. You know, they're more interested in their own generation and people who are like them. Um, and so we have to make sure that we are telling diverse stories um, that we're telling stories that have purpose, 
um, showing action and awareness. Uh, and I think that's really important. Can you give us some hints on what we can expect in Beijing on the Olympic channel? Sure. I know it's a secret now, but can you give us some <laughs> hints? Sure. Um, as I mentioned, um, we'll have uh, we'll have original series coming up between now and the end of January. So stay tuned. Um, those will really start to kick off uh, in November. November, December, January, as we really get into the heart of the winter season. During the games itself, uh, nine coverage in nine languages, um, a live blog letting you know what's happening. Um, we'll look to do some second screen experiences, hopefully. Um, we did one in Tokyo around sport climbing uh, with the sport climber Alex Honnold, where he was in the States. Um, we had a moderator and he was watching the sport climbing as it was happening and just sort of talking through um, these are people that he had climbed with. These were people he knew and sort of just explaining to us, oh, that's really hard. And sport climbing is a new sport. People may not be as familiar with it, um, but that was something that people really connected with. Um, he was answering questions from fans as we did it. And so how can we take that kind of experience and translate to that to winter sports is one of the things we're investigating right now. So maybe it will be applied to new sports, right? Potentially, yes. Okay, so how do you think the pandemic has changed the approach? What are some of the challenges that the pandemic brought to the Olympic channel? Uh, I think one of the challenges is certainly uh, access. Uh, we were really worried about not being at an event and not being able to speak to athletes. And I think, honestly, the pandemic created better access in many ways. Um, you had more access to athletes through Zoom, through Blinder, through different, through different applications. Uh, I think certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, people felt isolated. And so they were really eager to speak and to, to reach out and they wanted to share their stories. That's shifted as we've found ways to now to sort of start to live with COVID and, and to have different experiences. I think for Beijing, uh, the pandemic will have an impact in that last season for winter season was a bit chaotic um, and was not a normal season. And so it'll be interesting to see uh, how this season evolves, um, how people have been able to train. And I think we saw that in Tokyo. There were a lot of surprise medalists. There were a lot of things that people were like, whoa. And I think that potentially can happen in Beijing as well. So truly the pandemic is, brings some challenges, but also brings opportunities, right? Exactly. You said it really well. And I think it's so important that we remember again, most people can't be on, a, can't be on site at an event. So how do we always make sure that we're providing a great experience for them and think about things differently? Um, if we have the opportunity and the privilege of being on site with everything, let's not forget sort of all of those hacks that we had to make, those things we had to do and continue to be innovative and to do things in a different way. How do you think the figure skating community is in terms of what do they want? Live content or interviews or perhaps education videos? I think they want it all. <laughs> uh, I think interviews, but I think um, we all want a glimpse into somebody's life, right? We want to know how they're different from us and we want to know how we're similar. And I think figure skating fans, I have found, have an immense appetite for content. They want to know everything. They want to understand um, how that athlete lives in a day-to-day -day way. They want to understand what they're working on. They want to understand the intricacies of their programs. Uh, I think the opportunity we have in terms of building uh, a figure skating audience is sort of working at both ends. What can we provide for that hardcore fan who wants to know absolutely everything? And then how do we take someone who's a more casual fan and how do we give them, as you say, educational material, some information to better understand what they're seeing so they become an even bigger fan and they start to shift toward that super fan? Because figure skating contains many difficult techniques, right? Will you put more efforts on like introducing figure skating to those who do not know them? 
certainly. We certainly saw in Tokyo um, around new sports, for example, that explaining what a new sport was. And if you were watching surfing, here's what to look for. Here's what this means. Same thing with sport climbing. Figure skating by no means is a new sport. It has a very, very strong tradition. But again, with that casual fan coming in for the games, how can we help them understand why this jump in particular is very difficult? Or the risk um, that a pair skater has with a particular throw um, to understand the complexities of ice dancing. I think the more that we can explain that and, and by us, maybe it's not even us, but having the skaters themselves explain that it took them three months to be able to do X and to talk through why it's so difficult, I think that's always helpful. Speaking of X, well, you like interviewed or record um, like someone is going to uh, trying to do the quadruple axles. Are you going to record some document like this? Ah, uh, we don't have a plan at the moment specifically around that particular uh, move. Um, but yes, to the point that we need to explain to people here's what you might see, right? Um, here in this particular program, here are the three pivotal moments. This jump is very difficult because, um, and we certainly have within our archives information about uh, the first person to do a triple axel, things like that and why they mattered. And so, yes, always important to explain the history and what's about to be historic. How do you use social media to engage with the Olympic channel? Uh, through our Olympics accounts, uh, we do it in a variety of different ways. Um, Twitter, very news oriented, making sure that people are aware of what's happening. Um, with Instagram, we've done a lot of Instagram lives where we do, uh, you know, between a half an hour and an hour interview with athletes uh, and uh, give them an opportunity to ideally sort of show us where they live. Uh, I always use the example we did one with a swimmer, Chad Leclo from South Africa was in the beginning of the pandemic and he was walking us through his house where he was spending the pandemic and he walked through the kitchen and as he walked past the counter there were Doritos on the counter and the comments lit up everyone was like oh my god he has Doritos you're eating Doritos what's going on what's your diet like and so I think it's those glimpses into athletes worlds um, where you can see that this is their living room this is their backyard uh, we did an interview with a, a Mexican diver, and he has this amazing backyard, and he's got the Olympic rings on his fence. Um, and again, things light up. So I think those glimpses into the real life of an athlete are really important, and I think that's been an essential part of our social. How do you discover these kind of interesting content? Uh, read a lot. Uh, see what everyone else is doing in terms of their content. And it's really paying attention uh, to athletes um, and their own social channels and seeing what they're sharing, uh, paying attention to the interviews they do, um, and just being curious. Uh, I think that's the most important thing. And that's what we see in fans, right? They're curious. And so we have to be respectful of the questions they're asking and what they want to know. Um, when we first started talking about sport climbing, I sent the person, our reporter, I sent her a list of literally 50 questions of what is this? Um, and I think fans have those same questions and it's our responsibility uh, to answer those questions. And we have noticed that the IOC has invested in providing the games content three, 365 days a year. How does the Olympic channel go about games content and content outside games time? Sure, uh, the games never end. Um, and I think that's really important to remember. Uh, athletes have been working their entire lives uh, to participate in Olympic games. And so we wanna show what that's like, not just during the games, but what that's like for them a month after the games, what it's like for them nine months for the games. So it's telling the stories today of a winter athlete, but not forgetting about the athletes who are still working in summer sports and providing that mix every day. Uh, it's about how can we get you excited, a fan, about a sport maybe that you don't know as much about. Um, if you're a skateboarder, you probably like snowboarding. You probably do both. 
Um, but maybe you should understand that those same moves have this kind of connection to figure skating. Um, if you love figure skating, you know what? You should take a look at these three other sports. We think there's some good connection. And so it's trying to make sure that people have that information about not just the sport, but also these amazing people. Um, and again, looking at them as people. Um, is there an athlete who's super engaged in terms of sustainability and has their own charity and is working um, to improve water? Things like that. Um, making sure that those kinds of stories are told as well. So again, it's not just what an athlete does on the ice, but what they're doing in their everyday life and how they're working to change the world as well. Do you see even more growth and more investment in the production and distribution of digital content? What would be the strategic approach of the Olympic Channel going forward? Uh, I think women in sports has always been something that's uh, been very important to me for obvious reasons. Um, and so I think it's something certainly that uh, I've spent 30 years telling stories. Um, I've spent the majority of those 30 years in rooms with men. Um, and so it's really important to me. Uh, we track every single piece of content that we do. Um, is it about women? Is it about men? Is it about both? Every single piece of content. Uh, and I think the opportunity we have in particular around Olympic sports, we see every single game, there are more women watching and consuming that content. Um, and I think it's important, again, uh, gender is a really interesting topic right now. We need to be inclusive. Uh, we need to make sure that we're telling stories about all athletes, um, all gender identities, and making sure that we're creating environments on olympics.com, on our social channels, where people feel welcome, where they feel safe, uh, and where they can consume stories about people who are just like them. Thank you so much, Mrs. Byrne. Thank you. Thank you. We've learned a lot about Tokyo 2020 and also looking forward to Beijing Winter Games. And we Thank you so also much. look forward to your content, your interesting content that will we'll bring out, right? Thank Absolutely. You. And always welcome to any feedback or suggestions. Okay. Send me stories. Thank <laughs> you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you. See you. You too. Bye. Bye.